Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to give a guest lecture on causality. And thanks to Xun for the invitation. Uh, my name is Quinn. I'm fr from the philosophy department. So as you can see from the title, basically this lecture will be uh, basically about causal discovery and causal inference. By causal discovery, I mean how we can discover causal information from observational data by doing some statistical analysis. And by uh, causal inference, I mean how you can identify the causal effect of some variable on some other variable. So they are complementary, right? And both of them basically, one of them aim to find the causal information, the other aim to basically find a measure or find a way to evaluate the causal effect. OK. So before talking about the causality, this character explained my experience uh, regarding relationship between causality and the dependence of correlation. So when I was very young, I used to think that correlation implies causation. Essentially means, oh, if they are heavily correlated, or if there's a very heavy coincidence between them, then, oh, one of them might be the cause. But later, you know, after taking some classes, assessing the classes, I changed my mind because of the very well-known statement saying causation implies correlation, but correlation doesn't imply causation, right? So now, after basically doing research in this field for some time, we can say the following, yeah, that's true. Causation implies correlation, but correlation doesn't imply causation. But maybe it's better to say causality, sorry, causation implies correlation, but correlation doesn't directly imply causation. In almost all situations, we can just find the causality, causal information or causal relations from observational data, essentially from the pattern of dependence in the data. Okay, you will see how. We can see clearly association and, association and dependence are very different. So uh, we say two variables are associated, right? They have a kind of association, if and only if they are not independent. This is the definition of independence. There exist, there exist two different values of x, x, namely x1 and x2, and they have different distributions. They correspond to different distributions of y. When we say x is the cause of y, basically we define causality in terms of do, in term, uh, here by do, I mean intervention or manipulation. If you are familiar with Peter Spurti's language, basically he used a set, set the value of x to x1 and x2. So here do is intervention. Intervention in the particular way of changing the system. When we do intervention over here, essentially we do the following thing. We have a couple of variables in the system, right? In order to do intervention, we have to keep all the other variables unchanged at least for the moment, we can only change the value of x, capital X. So this is the intervention on x. We just change this variable, while all the other variables basically remain the same. And then, after that, after you do intervention, now you can see you set the value of x, capital X, to different values, x1, x2. Then, if you can observe after that, if you can observe different distributions of y, then we say, oh, there's the causal relation, causal influence from x to y. Intuitively, it makes sense, right? Why? Because I keep all the other things um, un unchanged, and then just change x. Then I observe some changes in y. Clearly, this changes, the change in y must be due to the change in x. In other words, x has a way to influence y, right? So you can see the whole definition relies on intervention. If you really want to define causation, you have to use intervention. However, a second. Now you can see the definition is a bit circular in the following sense. In order to do intervention, I have to keep all the other variables in unchanged, right? I can only change this variable. If I have no idea about how they are related, how can I guarantee that, right? So you define causality in terms of the intervention. However, without knowing anything about the causality, you cannot do intervention. That's why definition is circular. However, a circular definition is still helpful. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm just not sure about the quantifier for the second. Uh, why is it here? The same thing happened here, right? The same thing happened here, yeah. So basically, when we say they are independent, we mean, oh, first of all, the definition of independence is saying that no matter what values x1 and x2 take, as long, right? 
we, those two quantities are always the same, right? It, as long as you have two different values, corresponding to different distribution y, we say they are dependent. The same thing happens here. As long as there exists a pair of values, x1, x2, which are not identical, uh, and correspond to different distribution of y, we say x has a causal influence on y. Um, it's not, yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's too strong, right? Because suppose you are the cause, and suppose that uh, I'm the effect, right? Maybe I'm sensitive to some values, right? Some values in some particular range, but not to all values. It's totally possible, right? OK. So we care about the causality. And that's why you can see we have a lot of scientific papers and a lot of uh, basically news talking about the causality. This one is particularly interesting. In the Telegraph, they said, oh, couples who share their housework are more likely to divorce. So immediately, you may think, oh, this is the causal claim. This is a causal connection. But then you will be very careful. Because if you simply take any associational information as a causal connection, you can make huge mistakes, right? So you really want to see what's the underlying causal information over here. And then that's why, after this, you can see there was a lot of discussion. Does sharing housework really lead to divorce? Now, when you use the word lead to, essentially, you are talking about the causality. You want to see whether this is really the cause, right? With causality, you can do, basically, you can take action. You can do the uh, right thing. Because if you know the cause of information, you can do the right thing to achieve your goal, right? But if you just rely on association information, basically, it's completely irrelevant. Let you see. With the association information, basically you cannot do some, um, some tasks at all. And this is another example. Over here, x-axis is the uh, chocolate, consump chocolate consumption per year per capita. And the y-axis is the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million people in the country. So you can see basically there's a very nice dependence pattern, right? So maybe not it's multiplicative, but basically the correlation is very high. They are, he they are heavily dependent. Clearly, you want to see why they are dependent, right? Because you want to change something. So you want to increase the number of numeral uh, laureates. Or you want to improve the something, the power, right? However, you cannot just say, oh, now see, this is the pattern. That's why now we should eat more chocolate. We cannot do so. We have to see why. And then we, we know what to do to achieve our goal. OK, so in this lecture, uh, basically, I will, I will uh, talk about three things. The first is, uh, what we can benefit from causal thinking in a causal way. The second is about identification of causal effects. And the last thing is about causal discovery, essentially how you can estimate or find the causal information by statistical analysis uh, of the data. OK, so it's going to be very brief, but here I give a lot of material. If you are, if you are interested, you can just read the material. We. Clearly, we know we should distinguish between causal connections from associational information. This is the example discussed, intensively discussed by Fisher in the 1950s. So basically, you can see, finally, they agreed that smoking is a common cause, and yellow finger at that time. Yellow finger nails and lung cancer are, co are correlated. There is some relationship, some associational information between yellow fingers and lung cancer because of smoking, right? And then you know that, oh, if you want to change this, if you want to change the incidence of lung cancer, clearly you have to go back to the causes, not this variable, right? You cannot just change the color of the fingernails in order to change the incidence of uh, uh, lung, uh, lung cancer, right? So if you want to change something, clearly we have to go back to the causes, but not the variables which are only associated or correlated or dependent um, with this target variable. OK, this is very clear. We distinguish between them. Then let's have a look at this paradox called Simpson's paradox. This is a real, des a real world data set uh, discussed in the 1970s. Here, basically, we have uh, patients. We have uh, kidney stone pa patients that have some stone, right? Kidney stones. We have two groups of patients, one with uh, small stones, the other with large ones, so small and large. And then we have two treatments, A and B. 
you can see that for small stones, A is better. The recovery rate is higher. And for large stones, recovery rate for A is also better, higher, right? So that means, OK, for each group, essentially A is better if you only care about the recovery rate. However, after they mix the patients, combine the two uh, groups of people, they found that, oh, now B is better, as you can see from the higher recovery rate corresponding to B. So now comes the question, suppose you are a doctor, and you only care about the recovery rate of the patients. And now, suppose a new patient just comes to you. Would you like to recommend A or B? A, B, OK, so now you can see there must be some problem, because some, right, some recommend A, some recommend B. What's the problem here? Now you can see the following thing. This is purely associational over here. You just rely on the conditional distribution, right? And over here, now you can see why it's a paradox. The stone, a stone is either small or large, right? It's either small or large. If it's small, you recommend A. If it's large, you recommend A. But if you don't know, you recommend B. It cannot happen, right? So what's the problem here? It's because the associational information can be very tricky. Essentially, when we want to recommend something, we care about the causal effect. In particular, we care about the effect of treatment on recovery. We want to see we don't care about this because we don't change stone size, right? This is given, right? And then we want to see the property of this causal link, right? We make decision based on only the property of this link known as the causal effect, but not the associational information between this guy and that guy. Because of this common cause, the dependence pattern between those two variables can be almost arbitrary. OK? So you can see another example over here. X-axis is the X size, Y-axis is the cholesterol. So basically, you can see we have a lot of age groups, right? In each group, yeah, essentially, the more exercise you do, the less cholesterol you are going to have. That's good. We should do more exercise, right? But now, if you mix all, if you put them together, all data points, all, sub, all people together, you see, oh, the correlation is positive. That means from the observational data, it seems that the more exercise you do, the more cholesterol you are going to have on average, right? From this figure, you can see that, because the correlation is positive, right? So what's the problem here? Essentially, we cannot rely on this picture at all if you want to change something. If you just want to make passive prediction, it's fine, right? Because you only care about the conditional distribution. But if you want to do a recommendation to change something, you cannot rely on this picture. You have to go back to the causal picture. You have to rely on the causal effect. You have to estimate the causal effect from data. OK? Intuitive, is that clear? Now you can see that basically you cannot change the age group, right? Then you must fix the age. And then you can see, oh, for each age group, the more exercise you do, the less uh, cholesterol you are going to have. You recommend more exercise, right? So later we'll come back to this point. And the third one is about some strange dependence pattern. So in particular, in America, if you go back 50 or 60 years, you will see that, oh, female students were on average, smarter than male students. Why? So we believe that female students and male students are kind of equally smart on average, right? But over there, if you really go back to that time, you would find that, oh, female students are smarter. Why? What happened? So essentially, this also happened in the, um, in the 2016 election, presidential e election. The polling data turned out to be very different from the final decision, final outcome. Right? Because we have selection bias. Over there, if you go back, let's talk about this example. We have gender IQ. Originally, they were independent. Right? But at that time, admission to college is a common effect of those two factors, gender and uh, IQ. And as a consequence, as long as this, happen, this is happening, given this guy, they are dependent. They are not independent anymore. Right? So given the common effect, the causes will be dependent. 
That's why. And then you can do some calculation. For instance, in very uh, simple example, suppose x, y, suppose z is the sum of x, y. Now clearly, if you know the sum of x, y, they are not independent anymore, right? And i give you another example, um, which is very similar. So this is the Monty Hall problem. I think most of you already heard about it. This is the game. So basically, the host, Monty Hall, who just passed away two years ago, placed the $1,000 behind one of the three doors. And then, if you can find the right door, you get the money. Otherwise, you get nothing. So you make your initial choice, right? Say A. And then, Monty Hall will open another door. Say B. And say C. Behind this door, there's nothing. So the money is not behind the B, uh, door B. Would you like to stick with your, your original decision, which is A, or change your mind? Essentially, change your decision to, to, to C. So if you do you want to uh, stick with your original decision, which is A? No one, right? OK, so now basically, the causal process is very clear. We know that or originally, they are independent. Where the money is, it's independent from your initial choice, because you have no idea where the money is. And then, this is which door is to be opened by Monty Hall, by the host. It's clearly a common effect of the two independent things, right? And then, after this happens, after you see which door is opened, you know, oh, they are dependent. They are dependent, meaning that your initial choice actually contains information about where the money is, right? Then you have to rethink, at least you have to rethink your decision. And then after some calculations, say, oh, now I have to change my mind. The probability will be, uh, the chance for you to get money will be much higher. Actually, it's from one third to two thirds. Now you can see, if we have to care about, whenever you make a decision, you have to care about the underlying causal information, causal process, OK? Why do we use causal models? So I give you two reasons over here. One is that we can have a very efficient way, very convenient way to represent interventions and also infer the effect of interventions. Over here, suppose this is a valid causal picture. This, is the X, this guy, x1, is the common cause. And then we basically, each edge is a direct causal influence. Then suppose we want to change something. We want to say, we want to set the sprinkler on. We just want to turn it on. And then to represent this particular action or change or intervention, we just need to set the value of x3 to on and cut off all those, all those edges into x3. Why? Because we do change. We change something here. We don't care about the original process influence. Right? That's why we cut off all those edges into this guy. We set the value to on. This is the new graph. Right? This represents what we changed. And then, suppose you want to see the effect of this particular action on some other variable. You just need to do inference, right? Probabilistic inference on this new graph is done. If this is not causal, first of all, we cannot represent interventions so easily. Second of all, we have no idea what will be changed regarding this graph after you do interventions, right? So this is a very nice property of a causal system. If it's causal, then we have kind of modularity property. You change something here, and then those conditional distributions will not be changed, will not be changed by this particular intervention. That's why you can represent intervention and immediately uh, in for the effect of interventions. In many situations, we cannot make any change. We can only observe and make a prediction, right? So for instance, when we talk about the planets or stars, we cannot make any intervention. Newton didn't make any intervention uh, when he discovered the, um, the law of uh, universal gravitation, right? So we cannot make any intervention. However, by observe, uh, in many situations, we still care about the causal picture, even if we cannot make an intervention. Why? Essentially, this is because the causal model, roughly speaking, provides a compact way to describe the property of the joint distribution. Essentially, it tells us how the joint distribution can change across different scenarios or over time, right? So over here, you can see, oh, given this is the causal, then oh, at some point, maybe someone changed this. However, given this is the causal, I know all the other conditional distributions will be the same, right? If this is not a causal representation, I cannot guarantee that. So causality, essentially, um, implies kind of modularity. 
Because of modularity, the world is much, much simpler, right? Given a very complicated system, the modularity implies that, oh, the conditional distribution, the generating processes are not related. You can make a change here, but no way, basically, the conditional distribution or the color process for other variables will not be changed by this particular intervention. Let you see this uh, more clearly. So causal model provides a compact way to describe, the, to describe how the joint distribution of the data could change in different scenarios. And now we can see, given this interpretation, we can do a lot of things. For instance, for transfer learning, you observe a distribution over here in this scenario. You observe another distribution in a different scenario. You want to do information transfer. Generally, you want to make a prediction here. You, you know x, y values here, but only x values over there. So you want to make a prediction. What can we do in this case? If you have no idea regarding how they are related, we cannot do information transfer at all. Right? However, we know that causal structure is stable, is ontological. By that, I mean the following thing. We can trust the causal structure. When we say y equals x, there must exist a sequence of processes such that y changes x step by step. Right? It's about the world. It's ontological. So that means, oh, across different scenarios, I can trust that y is the cause of x. This information is shared by all those particular distributions. But the distribution are different. Why? They have different parameters in the color system. They have different color models, and so on. Right? But now, given this as a bridge, it's possible for us to go from a particular scenario to the bridge and then jump to another scenario. This is the bridge. And because of the bridge, we can do transfer. We can understand the new scenarios by making use of the information we already have in our experience or in the source domains. Right? So intuitively, you can see why we care about the causality here. It's ontological, it's stable, you can trust it, and then you can see the invariant part of the distribution and the part of the information that can change across the different scenarios. And then you can find a way to estimate the changing part, right? Or to make use of the invariant part to make a predict prediction. OK, so that's what we can benefit from causal thinking. Basically, you just saw some examples, and you can see, oh, a lot of pro if you want to solve a lot of problems, in including uh, intervention, interventional effect, uh, recommendation, re recommend recommendation of actions, you have to rely on causality. OK, we have three typical questions in computer science and artificial intelligence. The first one is the completely, completely uh, observational prediction. So we have data, right? We have a lot, a lot of variables, and we want to make a prediction. Basically, the question is something like this. Would the pavement, where is the pavement, uh, be slippery if we just find that the sprinkler is off? So it's just observational. I see this, then I want to make a prediction. This relies on the conditional distribution of slippery given sprinkler is off. Right? You can use different tools for making prediction. However, you just care about the conditional distribution, which can be dis uh, directly discovered from observational data. This is the first question, prediction. The second one is about the effect of interventions. In statistics, a lot of people are concerned with this, because you want, really want to see which action to take. The question is something like this. Would the pavement be slippery if we make sure the sprinkler is off? That means if we set this off, if we set sprinkler off, then you want to see the effect. You want to see the value or distribution of slippery. So it's represented by this particular type of conditional distribution, the probability of slippery given intervention on sprinkler. This is called the causal effect or interventional effect of sprinkler on slippery. Okay? Now you can see in order to solve this, this problem, you make use of your data, right? But that's not enough. You have to rely on the causal picture. Without knowing anything about the causal relations, you cannot solve the problem, right? Suppose x is the cause of y, then you can say, oh, x basically, you can say, oh, suppose x is the cause of y. We only have two variables, x, y. Then this causal effect is py given to x is the same as py given x. That you see y. However, if y is the cause of x, right, then the intervention effect of x on y is just the original distribution of y. Because intervention, in that case, the intervention on the effect 
done not change the intervention, uh, done not change the value of the cause. You can see clearly this is not symmetric, meaning that we have to capture the causal asymmetry in the representation. The last one is the counterfactual. So we want to ask basically the question is very similar. Will the pavement be slippery? Had the sprinkler been off? This is similar. However, in addition to this, we have additional information. We have, we, given that the pavement is in fact not slippery and the sprinkler is on, we observe something about this particular unit we are talking about, or about the situation we are talking about. Given the additional information, we can make better prediction. So we can see this is the effect of sprinkler on slippery, given the observed properties of the unit, of the particular person, of a particular scenario, of today, and so on. Right? So compared to causal e to uh, intervention e intervention effect, here we have more information about the particular unit you are talking about. Then you can give better predictions. Why? Because you know which group of people you are talking about. You have more specific information. That's why it's called the counterfactual. You very often times this is about the if causal effect of the particular unit. Over here we are talking about the, the total the whole population. Distribution, right? I have a, a group of people I want to see the cause effect. But over here, I can talk about a particular person, or I can talk about a particular group of persons, and so on. Okay, so we have those three questions, and you can see in order to ask uh, to answer those two questions, we have to use the causal picture. And now let's see how we can make use of the causal picture and the data to identify causal effects. This is a very classical problem. In statistics, a lot of people are still concerned with this problem identification of causal effects. Sometimes, sometimes they just say causal inference. OK, first of all, you want to make sure that this graph, the deck, usually it's a deck, right? Direct the secret graph represents the causal information, not just a way to represent the property of the distribution, right? So you learned uh, a lot of gra uh, graph structures, including decks, Bayesian networks, and so on. Most of the time, you want to use them to encode the property of the distribution, say a condition independent properties, right? You also want to find a compact way to represent the joint distribution, right? Here you have more conditions. Under those conditions, we can show that, oh, we can be sure that basically they represent causal information instead of associational information. Essentially, the condition that follows, roughly speaking, given this picture, how can I say the causal picture is a causal dig? I can just hold the value, basically fix all the other variables as some fixed values. Okay, I fix those values, then I can vary this thing. When I vary, when I change this guy, I can observe a change over here. Then we say, oh, this is the direct cause of X4. So this is the direct causal influence. Meaning that in this picture, each edge each edge just represents direct causal influence. Why? Because I fix all the other variables. I only make change here, and then I can see association over here. Right? Of course, when I change this variable, this guy will not be changed. That's why it's not symmetric, right? Because I fixed the value. Now, more precisely, we have three conditions to make sure that this is a causal picture. The first thing, essentially now, you can see we have to make use of intervention because we define the causation or causality in terms of the intervention. The first thing, or uh, first we have this distribution. This is the PXV. is the distribution of the variable set V after you do intervention on X. OK, this is a particular notion. Interve this is the probability distribution of V giving you already did the intervention on X. And they, we say a DAG is a causal DAG if, an, if those three conditions hold true. The first one says this interventional distribution is a Markov relative to G. What does that mean? It means, oh, for this distribution, the distribution of the variable after I do intervention, right? I can still factorize, factorize the distribution according to the graph. Right? It's a, remember, it can be factorized as a product of the individual probabilities of each variable given its parents, right? So now I can still do the same factorization for this distribution, meaning that the causal Markov condition still holds true. OK, this is the first condition. The second one says, oh, for the variables uh, on which I D 
did interventions, the value is fixed. So basically, you have a set of variables x, uh, which you, you intervene on. Now you can see, oh, if this value vi is consistent with that value x, then this probability is y. Because you already know the value, you fix the value, right? You set the value to some particular value, small x. That's why this is, this is very trivial. Why? Because you do intervention. You set the value to some particular value, then you know the distribution. And the last one says, after you do intervention, all the, for all, all the other variables over here, if you do intervention here, for all the other variables, the conditional distribution is the same as before. So if you compare the situation before you do intervention and the situation after you do intervention, then the conditional distributions for the variables you didn't intervene on would be the same. This is known as modularity. If I change something here, right, change something here, then basically nothing over there in other causal modules will be changed, right? Put them together, then, and then we have causal interpretation of the graph. We know each edge is, which edge, uh, each edge is a causal, direct causal influence. Okay, so this is the condition to guarantee that we have a causal dag. Is that clear? Given this, we have a causal interpretation and then when we can do causal inference. Yeah. Is the conditional also going to be the same value? Oh, give me a second. Over here. Essentially, it means you can just think of vi as xi. You do intervention on x, right? You set the value of x to some fixed value, say 1. Now, with the probability 1, x will take the value 1. That's it. And third point? Third point. Yeah. yeah. So if vi is 1? Oh, sorry. For all vi which is not in x, for the remaining variables. This is the modularity. So you only make a local change here, and then the other, the other part will not be changed by this. Is that clear? OK. So alternatively, you can use a structural equation model, a structural causal model to represent the causal relation. Essentially, we know there are each of them. We have a set of equations. Each of them is a causal equation, structural equation. Essentially, we cannot exchange the variables. Uh, on the uh, on different sides of the equation, because over here when we have this equation, we mean the following thing: the causal process assigns the value of x two by making use of the value of x one and some other factor. That's it. So this is a a way to assign the value to the variable on the left hand side of the equation. Right? It's not symmetric. You cannot just exchange them. You, you cannot exchange x one x two. If you exchange that, still, it's an equation. It's an algebraic equation, but it's not a causal equation. Over here, we have an auto uh, autonomy property. Essentially, it's a modularity. You can make change here. You can make change there. But basically, when you make change here, all the other equations will still be the same. Basically, there's no reason for other equations to change because of this particular change. This is the modularity or autonomy of causal system. OK, now. We have the questions, and the second one is about the interventional effect, a causal effect of x on y. How can we estimate this? In particular, a traditional way is to use kind of randomized control experiments. If you want to see the effect of treatment on recovery, what can you do? Right? You know, OK, I have two groups of people. One, one of them receives A, the other receives B. We have two groups of people, right? A and B. And then we have to do the following thing. All the other factors that influence the outcome, which is recovery, are either fixed across the two groups or vary at random across the two groups. And then if you see any difference in the recovery, in the outcome recovery, this must be due to the different value of treatment across the two groups, right? Because all the other features either have the same value or very completely at random across the two scenarios, the two groups. Then you can say, oh, if there's any difference in outcome, there must be, basically the, the difference must be caused by the different value of the treatment. Right? So this is the way to identify the, tre the treatment effect or causal effect. This is very hard to do. First of all, 
you have to collect a lot of people, a lot of, um, a lot of subjects. Second of all, you have to guarantee this condition holds true. This is so hard. We have so many covariates, so many other factors. How can you guarantee that all those factors will have the same value across the group or uh, very completely random across the, two, across the two groups? This is so hard. That's why it's very expensive. And in many situations, this is replaced by the so-called observational studies of causal effects. So you make use of some causal information and you make use of observational data to infer the causal effect. Let's come back to this example. Over here, we have data. We know stone size, basically, they are dependent, they are dependent. And we have this causal picture. So now, this is the conditional distribution. If you capture the condition, or if you just want to make a prediction, you make use of this conditional distribution of recovery given, uh, given treatment, right? This is just a chain rule, a product rule, and some rule. When you want to infer the causal effect, what do you do? Remember this. The causal effect is represented by the probability of recovery given the intervention on treatment. Right? I set the, treatment, the value of treatment to either A or B over here. This means I do intervention over here. This also means I cut off all those edges into this variable. Right? If I want to infer the causal effect. That means, oh, I don't have this. Oh, where the, I, I missed something. So here, this edge will disappear because I do intervention over here. Then, then after I cut this guy off, S and T, stone side and treatment, are not dependent. They will become independent because I assign the value of the treatment independently from stone size, right? So you will replace the probability of S given T, uh, stone size given treatment, with the probability of S, the marginal distribution. Now you can see the following thing. Originally, when you catch at this, those values by making use of the conditional distribution, basically you did this. Over here, this is the, small, uh, the group of small stones, the group of large stones. Now over here, I have a lot of people right, with small stones um, who receive treatment B. And over here, you can see more people uh, with light stones receive treatment A. Am I right? Yeah. You see this. When you want to make a prediction, or when you want to calculate the expectation, expected recovery rate, you do the following thing. You do the weighted average. right? Over here, I have a lot of people. That's why the final weighted average is very close to this value. And the same thing happened here. As a consequence, you can see, oh, after you take the uh, average, this recovery rate, on average, is higher than this, right? This is because you make use of probability of stone size given treatment. This is the weight when you catch the expectation. However, when you use this equation, you can say, oh, I use the same way to weigh, to weight different, different uh, people, different possibility. Essentially, I use the same distribution when I catch the expectation. Now, you have this line. Clearly, A is better. This is a causal effect. The only difference in this example is that you just use the marginal distribution of S instead of the conditional distribution of S given T, stone size given treatment. Why, why do we do so? This is because if we really do intervention, they are independent. Then probability of S given T is the marginal probability of S. Right? OK. So it's just an example. If you want to know more, essentially, you have to uh, get familiar with some definitions. First of all, this is known as the causal effect, the probability of y given to x. This is the causal effect of x on y. It's the first definition. And then we have a definition of uh, identifiability of causal effect. What does that mean? Essentially, we have two things now to see the causal effect. First, we have a causal structure, as you can see from here. And the second, we have data, observational data for some of the variables. For instance, for instance you may have observ observed the value for treatment and recovery. In this case, we don't have value for stone size. This is a confounder because it's a latent direct common cause of those two variables. Right? It's a direct common cause. And if it's a further hidden, it's not observable, then we say it's a confounder. So in this case, 
we have three variables in the color picture, color structure, and this guy is missing. We only observe the values for those two variables, right? Then you want to answer the following question. You, I have two models. By model, I mean color structure and observational data, or the distribution of some variables implied by the observational data. I want to see whether the two models can always give the same estimate of the color effect. I want to see whether they always give rise to the same conditional distribution y given to x. If this is the case, then if the answer is yes, we say, oh, the causal effect is identifiable. Because the information I have, which is the model, can give a unique uh, solution, unique answer to the question. Otherwise, I say it's not identifiable. If it's not identifiable, then you cannot give an estimator, right? Because in this case, there will be an infinite, infinite number of solutions. Is that clear? So now, try to answer the following question. Suppose we don't have stone size. Suppose the color picture is just this, treatment cause recovery. We don't have a confounder or common cause here. And suppose you observe values for treatment and recovery. Do you think the cause effect of treatment on recovery is identifiable? Yes or no? So you observe, this is the color picture, x causes y. That's all. You observe values for x and y. You observe a lot of data pairs, right? Is the color effect of x on y Is this identifiable from, from the structure and the data you have? No. In this case, clearly, yes. Why? Why? Because if you do intervention here, this part will not be changed, right? So in this case, this is nothing but the original distribution of y given x. If this is the case, right? If we don't have a confounder, that's clear, right? However, now let's consider this. We have a common cause, derived the common cause C, and C is not observable. Meaning that we don't have values for C. We only observe values for X, Y, recovery and treatment. Uh, recovery and treatment. In this case, is the cause effect identifiable? Yes or no? Remember the Simpsons paradox. Right? We have a confounder over here. Then we can have, clearly we can have different models with the same structure and the same distribution for x, y, but not z, but not z, right? Which will give different estimates, different estimates for this quantity. You can just imagine two scenarios. In the first scenario, we just know, now we just know the marginal distribution, relative marginal distribution of x, y, because we don't have the information about the c. Now we can see, oh, maybe suppose those links are very, very weak. Then this is the same as the first situation, right? I suppose this guy is not there. Then I can identify this cause effect, which is the probability y game x. And in the second scenario, suppose this guy has a very heavy influence on x and on y. As you can see from the paradox uh, example, now you can see, oh, basically, I only observe the associational information of x, y. I have no idea about this, in the linear case, I have no idea about this particular coefficient at all. I cannot determine this coefficient at all, right? When we say color effect, we only, basically, we care about this coefficient. If this coefficient is very large, we say the cause influence is very large. If this is zero, we say, oh, in the linear case, we say there are no cause influence of x on y, right? We only care about this particular coefficient. But clearly, we cannot identify this coefficient from only the distribution of x, y, if we also have a c variable over here as a common cause, right? But in the first case, clearly, it's just a regression problem. If you don't have C, then you can do regression. You can find the value of gamma, right? OK, now let's see some conditions under which uh, the causal effect is identifiable. There exist different scenarios, different uh, frameworks. Donald Rubin from Harvard proposed the propensity score-based framework. 
And here, Peter Spurtis and also uh, UW Pro from UCLA adv uh, advocated another framework based on graphical models, based on graphical representations or graphical criteria to, uh, to see the causal effect. So now let's have a look at the graphical representation. Essentially, we can see the following thing. If a set of variables z satisfies the so-called backdoor criterion relative to x, y, then we can identify the effect of x on y by making use of this. I, I, just, I already gave this, uh, this equation. The, over here, if you calculate the conditional distribution, then this is the probability of z given x, right? If you just make use of the product and some rule, this is the probability of z given x. Now, by x hat, I mean do x. This is another way to put it. Probability of y given do x. Then you can see, oh, I just replaced the conditional distribution of z given x by the probability of z. Remember, we just we did that. OK, so if z satisfies the backdoor criterion, then we can just estimate the causal effect this way. It's unique. It's identifiable. What's the backdoor criterion? It's very intuitive over here. We say z satisfies the backdoor criterion relative to x, y, x, i, x, j. If those two conditions hold true, first of all, no node in z is a descendant of x, i. OK, so no variable of z could be here. Can be, they can only be here. And then the second condition says that z blocks every path between x, i, and x, j that contains the arrow into x, i. That's why we say it's a backdoor criterion. We only care about the backdoor passes, which are into xi. That's backdoor, right? Not frontdoor. This is the frontdoor of, x relative to, uh, of xi relative to xj. And over here, you have backdoor. So z blocks all the backdoor passes into xi. Backdoor passes between xi and xj that are into xi. Now you can see, in this case, do you, think the, do you think C, this variable, satisfies the backdoor criterion relative to x, y? Yes or no? First of all, it's not over here. It's not a descendant of x. Second of all, this guy, given this guy, this path this is the only backdoor path, right? This is the only backdoor path. This guy is blocked by C. Right? That's why over here, C satisfies the backdoor criterion relative to xy. That's why we can just do the correction. We can just estimate the causal effect of x on y that way. OK? So now let's check. What if z is a 3 and 4 over here? If z is a set of three x3 and x4, do you think z satisfies the backdoor criterion relative to x i, x j? Oh, Xun, uh, did I learn about uh, this separation? Yeah. OK, that's good. So over here, do you think z satisfies the backdoor criterion? Yes? Yes, OK, yes, you can check. Basically, all backdoors. All backdoor paths are blocked by x3 and x4. OK, if this is the case, we are very happy. It's done. The second condition, the front door criterion, essentially is similar. Over here is the front door. Uh, it's in the front door. Oh, basically, it's on the path from x, to x, uh, from x to y and so on. I'm going to uh, skip all those um, results. So maybe you want to read this later. Over here, you can see an example as to how you can identify the causal effect of smoking on, on cancer. And over here, you can see the relationship between the two frameworks. One is the potential outcome framework, the other is the graphical representation framework. So you can see how they are connected. Clearly, you can interpret one of them in terms of the other. And, OK, if you use the potential outcome framework, just remember that you have to define a variable, particular kind of variable called counterfactual variable or potential outcome variable. Here, by capital Y, small x, we mean the following thing. This is the random variable. You do intervention on x, and then this is uh, about the distribution of y. 
after you do intervention on x. Clearly, it's a random variable. Why? Because we don't know which unit we are talking about, right? We have a uh, distribution. So it's a random variable. Over here, by you, we mean the unit, a particular person or particular subject you are talking about. OK, so skip this. And people try to give a unification and try, basically try to give a sufficient and necessary conditions under which um, the cause effect is identifiable. OK, skip this. You can see different scenarios. And in many situations, we can further benefit from parametric uh, assumptions. So in this case, you can see the cause effect of x and y is not identifiable. However, if everything is linear, then it becomes identifiable. In economics, this is known as instrumental variable. Z is the instrumental variable because Z does not share the information of the confounder over here, of the confounder of x, y. This is the instrumental variable. Then you can estimate the parameter alpha, okay? Because it's just a correlation between Z and Y. Uh, sorry, the, it's just the ratio of the correlation between Z and Y to the correlation between x and Z. So you can estimate the alpha, but generally speaking, in the non-parametric setting, you cannot identify the cause effect of x on y because of this bidirected path, bidirected edge. By, with the bidirected edge, basically I mean that over here you have a confounder. You have some variable as a common cause of x and y. Okay. And finally, uh, if you really want to calculate the cause effect, you have to do the following thing. Given it's identified, we have to make use of this equation, right? Probably the C. And unfortunately, you have, suppose you have two group of people, right? Um, one receives A, the other receives B. However, probability of the stone size is not the same across the, two, uh, across the two groups. They can be very different. If they are the same, if the probability of the stone size in that example is the same across the two groups, then you don't, have, you don't have this issue. Why? Because you can just, it's already a randomized control experiment, right? Over here, all the other factors have the same distribution. You're lucky. But in most situations, probability of a stone size is different across the two, uh, the two groups. What can we do? We have to do matching. We have to adjust the distribution of stone size so that after you adjust the distribution, they become the same. Because in theory, you have to use the same probability of C across the two groups with different values of X. That's why you, can, you have to do distribution matching. You can use importance weighting and so on. However, in many situations, the covariance or other factors are high dimensional. In this case, estimating the density would be very hard, right? Estimating the de importance uh, ratio would be very hard. That's why people propose the propensity score. Basically, propensity score is another variable. Propensity score, in this case, see basically the uh, set of other covariance. Then propensity score is a variable defined as the probability for x to be 1 given the other covariance. So it's a random variable. Why? Because over here is a function of C. C is a random variable. That's why it's a random variable. So this is the propensity score. Now we can prove that, oh, given the propensity score, X and C are conditionally independent. And because of this property, you can further show that, oh, now I don't need to consider the distribution of the covariance, high dimensional thing. I only consider the distribution of the propensity score variable, only HC. HC is very simple. It's just a univariate variable, right? It's just a very simple variable. It's much, much simpler to estimate. OK, so this is the propensity score and why we can make use of the propensity score. OK, read the slides if you are interested. Why not go? OK, very quickly, uh, I, we have 20 minutes for causal discovery. So essentially, you can see, um, about 30 years ago, people came up with a framework called constraint-based causal discovery. Here, by constraint, I mean most of the time we mean conditional independence constraints. And then in the last 10 or 12 years, people came up with different non-Gaussian or non-linear methods. And then you can see that on the very mild assumptions, you can recover the underlying causal DAG uniquely. And then I will very briefly talk about some extensions to really deal with the uh, practical issues. Oh. OK, so how can you find the causal information? We just made use of causal information, right? We made use of a causal structure. If you want to identify the causal effect, you have to 
have access to the causal structure, right? Without this, you have no idea about the causal, causal influence. However, in practice, in many situations, we have no idea about the causal structure. That means we have to discover the whole structure or the essential information of, <clears throat> of the structure from data, from purely observational data, right? Traditional way to find the causal information is to make, basically make use of intervention. If you can really do intervention and observe the effect of intervention, you can find the causal relationships. Over here, um, if you manipulate, I use intervention and manipulation, uh, manipulation in, uh, exchangeably, so basically interchangeably. They, they, they are the same thing. They are just an intervention. So over here, the hot weather, high, high sales of ice cream, we know this is the cause and that this is the effect, right? Because in our experience, we observe a lot of scenarios, and there exist scenarios like this. All the other variables in the system, right, seem to be the same. They take the same value. How only this guy takes different values, and then later I observe this. This is a kind of intervention, right? I keep all the other variables, the values of all the other variables. I only change this particular variable, and then I observe a change over here. I can say this is the cause of that, right? So it's really hard. To see how hard it is, let's have a look at another example. Over here, suppose this guy go to work by bus. Around 8 or 8.30, this guy is leaving home. At the same time, the bus is coming. So the two events have a kind of coincidence. They are dependent, right? This is happening and this is happening. Now, is there a causal relation between them? So we can see, do you think there is a causal relation between them? Suppose I want to do interventions, right? What can I do? I want to change this particular event. I want this guy to stay home by doing, say, I can change the timetable of the bus, right, the schedule. If I change that, yes, this guy will stay home. Maybe he will stay home for another five minutes, right, after I change the timetable. Also, I can see a change here, right? Can I say this is the cause of that? You, yeah, why? Well, because you don't know, um, you do this much change the time, so you don't know um, what the person on that back is being for the first time as well as the man. Wonderful, yeah. So basically, it's not an intervention, right? Because this change actually, I change this, I intended to change this, right? She changed this variable. But unfortunately, this is not a valid intervention because I changed the other variable at the same time. Right? It's not intervention. That's why you can see it is really hard to, uh, to do intervention without understanding the system, right? So, of course, here there exists a lot of intervention because we know the process. We know how they are related. We know the color picture. That's why we can easily design interventions. For instance, if, if this guy is about to leave home, I can just close the door, right? I lock the door. This is the intervention because over here I only change this particular event. And similarly, you can just force the bus to stop in some way, in good or bad way. But you can do that, right? This is a valid intervention. However, without knowing the property of the system, it's really hard to find the right way to do intervention. That's why it's very expensive, and in many situations, it's even impossible. OK, we find the cause information from data. Here you can see a paper published a, couple of year, uh, published a couple of years ago. Here, but the conclusion is that large-scale psychological differences within China from north to the south are caused by rice versus wheat agriculture. You can see in this study, first of all, you cannot do intervention. Even if you can do intervention, you have to wait really a long time to see the effect. Right? Maybe after 1,000 or 2,000 years, you can see the effect. But you cannot live that long, right? So you have to analyze the observational data. Here, basically, they collect the data x, agriculture, y, culture, z, climate, uh, geometric information, and so on, a lot of other variables. They found that x and y are dependent, as that x and y are always dependent, given any z. And finally, on the very mild assumption, they say x is the cause of y. You will see y. Here, you can see the, how the constraint-based method for causal discovery works. To summarize, the method makes use of conditional independence constraints. 
So you have data. From data, you can discover independence and conditional independence constraints. And then you want to find a DAG or a set of DAGs to satisfy those constraints. That's it. And first of all, you assume called the Markov condition. This is clearly acceptable, right? This is the property of the graph called the Markov condition. You talk about it called the Markov condition. And in addition to that, we have to assume faithfulness assumption for those methods. Later, you can see for, for a lot of methods, we don't need to use a faithfulness. But now we have to. Why? Because if you just want to learn a basic network, network structure without the causal interpretation, it's totally fine to avoid this assumption. Why? Because you are not talking about the ground truth behind the data. You just want to make use of the property of the distribution or encode the property of the distribution. However, if you want to guarantee that the information you discovered from the statistical data or from the statistical property of the data to correspond to some underlying truth, you have to assume this. You see why. OK, this is how it works. We have independent constraints, and then we can just remove edges because they are conditionally independent, and then we find the causal direction, and then we do orientation propagation. We can find the direction for more edges. That's it. To do so, now we have to establish the relationship between independence and conditional independence in the data and structure property, the property of the causal structure. What can we do? You learn about deceptuation and the Markov condition, right? That says that if you have a deceptuation between x, y given z, then we know x, y are conditionally independent given z, right? Structure tells us independence properties. That's it. We can verify independent properties in the data by making use of a statistical test or some other techniques. Now the problem is how it can go back. You know, you want to find a simple graph, simple graph to explain the data, right? So if the, given this, you can see the counterpositive of this claim is that if they are dependent, then they are not deseparated, right? Then it's trivial to have a graph, a graph, fully connected graph. Then this graph will always, basically, you can see Markov condition always holds true. Why? Because the graph does not say any, anything about independence. You observe independence, that can happen by accident, right? I do not tell you whether they are independent. You observe independence. This is not a violation of the Markov condition, right? So that means the Markov condition is not sufficient. If I want to say something about the structure, what can we do? Over here, in particular, we, we assume this. We assume that all independence properties in the data you observe are actually entailed by the structure uh, entailed by the Markov condition on the graph. That means, if under this assumption, if they are conditionally independent given z, then x and y are deseparated by z. So this is the faithfulness assumption. Now, given faithfulness, we know okay they are equivalent. That means we can go back to deseparation by analyzing the independence properties of data, right? If they are independent, then they are deseparated. This is the faithfulness. And then we can do causal discovery. Essentially, you can see, with the Markov condition, we can go from the causal structure to the statistical properties, uh, properties of the data, independence property of the data. And with faithfulness, we can go back. Because faithfulness just said, all observe the independence or conditional independent relations in the data are entailed by the Markov condition on the graph. They have no extra independence relation in the data. OK, I give an example where this assumption does not hold true. Then you can see why we have to assume this. Suppose x calls y. And suppose there are two ways for x to call y. And suppose it's a linear model, linear Gaussian model. So we have, two th we have three parameters, a, b, c. Now, very unfortunately, we have the following thing. a, b plus c equals 0. Given this equation, we know, oh, x and y are completely independent, right? x and y are independent because the influence of x on y essentially is completely canceled out, 
right? If you ignore, ignore this here, oh, this is the path, this is the other causal path, basically the total effect of x and y will be zero, right? So now you can see, oh, I have extra independence. x and y are independent in this case. And this independence relationship is not entailed by the markup condition. Because if you, if you apply a markup condition, you say, oh, I don't know. Basically, markup condition does not tell us that x and y are independent. OK, given this, now it's very nice. We know that they are, if they are if there's any way for them to be independent, if there's any way for them to be independent, they must be de-separated. De Two variables are always de-separated if and only if they are not adjacent. If they are adjacent, then no variable can de-separate them. Right? So now you can see, oh, you already know the method. Essentially, to, de to develop a method, you have to answer two questions. First, can we find a skeleton without a direction? Yes. Why? Because we just made use of this. We just discovered that. If there's any way for them to be conditionally independent, then they are not adjacent. Otherwise, they are adjacent. Right? And the second, can we find a direction? Later, you can say, yeah, we can find a direction. OK, let me just illustrate this procedure uh, with this example. Over here, this is the underlying color graph. We observe data generated by this graph with four variables. One, two, three, four. And first of all, from data, we can find the independent relations. In, particular, in this particular case, according to Markov condition, it's not surprising that we can find the independence between one and two, condition independent between one and four given three, and the condition independent between, three, uh, between two and four given three. Right? We can do so. Now, suppose we have, suppose we have those properties implied by data. We analyze data and find the site properties. Now, how can we find the, uh, the code structure? We begin with a fully connected graph, undirected, fully connected graph. And then we do independent test. First, we test for marginal independence. If they are independent, we get rid, we get rid of this edge. Why? Because if they are adjacent, then there does not exist any set of variables condition on which they will become independent. So they are always conditionally dependent, giving anything. So if they are independent, we can get rid, get rid of this edge. And then we increase the, uh, the cardinality of the condition set. We now have a condition on some variable, and then we check for independent, condition independence. Now we can see, oh, one for independent, given three, that's why we get rid, get rid of this one, and we, finally we can get rid of this one. And then we stop. <coughs> uh, you see with the PC procedure, we can automatically stop over here. And then in the second step, we know, oh, one, two are independent. Then we know this is the V structure. They are independent because on the faithfulness assumption, this is the only way for them to be independent. If the direction is this way, then they cannot be independent. If the direction is this way, they cannot be independent. So this is the only way for them to be, the only possibility of the structure in which x1 and x2 are independent. This is called V structure. One and two are independent, given something. Over here is the, given the empty set. And they are adjacent to some other variable. Then this must be a V structure. And then we discover the V structure. Finally, we do orientation propagation. We know, oh, x3 is the cause of x4. Why? Because if this guy goes this way, then we have another V structure, which is fake, because we already discovered all V structures before this. Given it's not this structure, we know this direction must go this way. OK? So this is how you can discover the skeleton and the uh, uh, causal directions by making use of independence constraints, which you can discover from data. Is that clear? Can you always the Oh, yes, good. That's a good one. So <clears throat> unfortunately, most of the time, we cannot. Yeah. Clearly, you cannot. Because if you have two variables, x, y, you have no idea about the color direction, right? So we usually, we have say, we end up with a Markov equivalence class. All graphs in this equivalent class have the same independence and conditional independence relations. That's it. And in many, unfortunately, they have the same skeleton. And for some of the edges, we don't have a direction, right? Over here, we have a direction. That's it. 
So we, over here, you can see the summary. We re rely on Markov condition and the phase funding assumption, a typical al algorithm is called PC algorithm. And in the, step, in the first step, we check for adjacency by doing independent test, and then we, we find the base structure, and then we do orientation propagation. That's it. This is the algorithm. I'll skip this. OK, this is the propagation. After I, find, after I find all these structures, if I find this, then I know, oh, I have to orient this guy this way. Otherwise, I have a fake V structure. And if I have this, I have to orient this graph this way, this edge this way. Otherwise, I will have a feedback. I have a loop, right? So here, we assume it's a direct acyclic graph. Of course, we can discover a cyclic graph. That's another story. But for now, let's assume it's a cyclic. OK, this is how you can represent the solution with the pattern. Essentially, you have direct edges and undirect edges. For the undirect edges, we just don't know the direction, right? That's it. So you can see some applications. Let me skip the applications. This is very interesting because it's a really hard problem. So my collaborator collected a lot of variables, and they want to understand the causal relations between those variables. It's a really big thing in archaeology. Uh, we apply this method with the kernel based condition in test, and finally we discover this picture. And it makes sense. OK, now, I was just now, actually, I assumed that there was no confounder and no select. I also assumed there are no selection buyers. I don't have time to talk about selection process, selection buyers, but for now, let's just talk about the confounder. I assumed that there was no confounder. This is really restrictive. But in many situations, we can have confounders, right? We cannot discover all variables. We cannot find all relevant variables. However, fortunately, in many situations, you can still say something about the confounder. Let's just have a look at two examples. First one, we, from data, we discover that uh, x1, x2 are independent. Also, we have independent between 1 and 4 given 3 and 2 independent given 2 and 4 given 3. Now, can you write down the structure you discover from data? So essentially, let me just write down. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, right? They are not adjacent, they are not adjacent, they are not adjacent. So we have this. If you apply PC, you have this, right? And with PC, you know, oh, this is what we just got. With PC, you can do this. Now, try to answer the following question. Do you think it's possible at all to have a confounder behind x3 and x4? Do you think it's possible? Any idea? Actually, it's not possible. Why? Because if there's a confounder, C over here, right? Then X, X1 and X4 cannot be conditionally independent given X3. This path, this path is always open given X3 because you have a collider here, right? So that means, oh, from the independence between 1 and 4, given 3, and further the fact that x1 is not an effect of x3, that's why there must be an arrow into x3 over here, I can infer that definitely there is no confounder behind x3 and x4. This is cool. Why? Because you can really say something about the universe by making use of a very small number of independence relations, right? So in this case, we can say definitely, if you have enough data, there cannot be any confounder behind x3 and x4. And as a consequence, x3 is the direct cause of x4 without any problem. You can say so. Uh, there was some application of this. Uh, so essentially, that identified, uh, uh, it's about, I think it's almost 30 years ago, Peter and Clark uh, applied this algorithm, and they said, they concluded that this guy is a direct effect of uh, direct cause of this guy, and finally, basically, other people did a lot of experiments to verify this, and it's true. So you can really discover a lot of information. You can discover that there are no confounder in the universe for those two variables by making use of only very few condition-dependent relations. This is cool. Another example: 
you have independent between 1 and 3, independent between 1 and 4, and independent between 3 and 4. Now, can you just draw this uh, color picture? So you have okay to save time. I will I will skip this. Basically, here they are independent. They are independent. They are independent. In this case, there must be confounders behind x two and x four. Otherwise, you cannot have independent between one one four. And furthermore you know x2 cannot be a cause of x1. Okay, I will not explain the rules. However, if you want to see why, you can just go through all possibilities and see, oh, basically this is the only, pos uh, only situation. In this case, you can infer that there must be confounders over here, and there are no, you can also infer that there are no edge between 2 and 4, no cause influence between 2 and 4, and over here x1 cannot be the effect of x2. And furthermore, x3 is not the effect of x4. Right? We don't assume, now you can see, we don't assume there are no confounder. We allow all possibilities. But still, we can say something about the existence of confounders. We can see something about the causal direction. This is cool. Basically, this algorithm is called FCI, fast causal inference algorithm. So this is because you can really infer the uh, properties of the confounders from the independent relation you have. Unfortunately, if you have latent variables, then you cannot represent the final graph with a pattern. We just define the pattern or Markov equivalence class. We have to use another thing called PEG, partial ancestral graph. And the interpretation is more complicated. We have a circle over here. A circle, well, if you have a circle here, it just means it can be a arrowhead or a arrow tail. We don't know. So in this particular example, the output of FCI is as follows. X1, here I don't know. But over here, I know this must be an effect. And over here, there must be a confounder. And over here, so this is the output of FCI. If you have data generated by this graph. Very informative, right? Sometimes I don't know. But the results are guaranteed to be asymptotically correct. Over here, you know there's a confounder. And you know 4 and 2 cannot be the causes of 1, 3, respectively. OK, so now you see we can discover confounders, and we can really do something. Uh, later, you can read the slides. You can see how we can use the score-based method. Essentially, you just optimize some score to find the structure to maximize some score. And then uh, you can just read the last part. It's about how you can discover the whole structure by making use of non-Gaussian distribution or non-linear non functions. And finally, uh, oh, let me skip this. Uh, too much? And finally, you can see, if you really want to make it really practical, you have to consider a lot of scenarios. So here you can see a list of practical issues, and then you can see how those practical issues can be solved one by one. And finally, we can do really do reliable causal discovery at some point. OK, thank you. <laughs>